the North Atlantic right whale, you're in the right place. Coming up, we'll hear from Hui whale trauma specialist Michael Moore, commercial fisherman Rob Martin, and NOAA Fisheries ecological economist Mike Asaro. All that and more in just a few minutes. Hi, everybody. In just a few minutes, we'll get started with Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution's Ocean Encounters presentation about saving the North Atlantic right whale. We've still got a lot of people joining us, so thank you for your patience. We'll get started soon. Hello, everyone. We've still got quite a number of people joining us. So uh, thank you for your patience. And very soon we'll get started with Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution's Ocean Encounters presentation about saving the North Atlantic right whale.
The ocean covers 70% of the globe. It gives us oxygen and food and millions of jobs. It brings joy and shapes our climate and weather. The ocean is life and it belongs to everyone. Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is the world's independent leader in ocean discovery, exploration, and education, working to understand and sustain one of humanity's most precious common resources. Join us today for our ocean, our planet, and our future. Welcome to the Ocean Encounters virtual series from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, or HUI, as we like to call it for short. Tonight's presentation is Saving the North Atlantic Right Whale, Exploring Partnerships and Solutions for Survival. HUI's Ocean Encounters online events are made possible in part by the Avatar Alliance Foundation and Dalio Philanthropies. Thank you. My name is Veronique LaCapra. I'll be your host for tonight's event. Before we hear from our presenters, I'd like to take just a minute and share some tips on how you can optimize your experience with us on Zoom. Later on this evening, our speakers will be taking questions from all of you. If you'd like to participate in this live Q&A, please use the Q&A function on your, at the bottom of your Zoom screen and type in your question to the window that appears. You might be more familiar with the chat function in Zoom, but for tonight, please use the Q&A function instead. We often get hundreds of questions, so I apologize ahead of time if we don't get to yours while we're live. You can ask questions anytime starting now. I also wanna let you know that we are recording this event and that recording will be made available on the hui.edu website. We actually had more than 2,000 people pre-register for this event, so you're in very good company. Thank you and welcome to all of you. All right, let's get started. The North Atlantic right whale is one of the most endangered whales on the, in the world with an estimated 360 individuals left. These whales spend much of their time off North America's densely populated East Coast which makes them vulnerable to human activities. Ship strikes and entanglement in fishing gear kill more right whales than natural causes. And in recent years, more whales have died than have been born. We're broadcasting this evening from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, where the right whale is especially well loved. Each spring, most of the surviving members of the species visit Cape Cod Bay to feed for a few days or a few weeks, the scientists working to save them know and can recognize each one as an individual by the unique white growths on its head called uh, callosities. You might've seen that in the slideshow. And scientists have actually given the whales names. When a calf is born, it, it's a cause for celebration. And when one is killed or goes missing, the community mourns. Tonight, we'll examine the top threats facing North Atlantic right whales and discuss collaborative efforts by the scientific community, fishing industry, and policymakers to develop effective solutions that can ensure the long-term survival of this amazing and critically endangered species. We have three speakers with us this evening. They are Hui whale trauma specialist, Michael Moore, commercial fisherman, Rob Martin, and NOAA Fisheries, ecological economist, Mike Asaro. First, thank you to all three of you for joining us this evening to talk about saving the North Atlantic right whale. Let's start with Michael Moore. Michael is a biologist and veterinarian and the director of Hui's Marine Mammal Center. His research encompasses the physiology and pathology of whales and other marine mammals, he studies the effects of trauma from ship strikes and fishing gear entanglements on the survival and welfare of North Atlantic right whales. And he's currently working with fishers, regulators, and others to reduce threats to these vulnerable giants of the sea. Michael, welcome. Good evening and thank you. So if we can see the first slide, this is an aerial drone photograph of a North Atlantic right whale on its side in Cape Cod Bay in 2019, with its mouth open, skim feeding on plankton. Top left is the upper jaw with baleen suspended from it, partly covered by the large lower lip. It has white belly patches like many of them do, 
right whales can weigh up to 50 tons and be 50 feet long. There are three right whale species. All of them were heavily hunted by whalers. In yellow, the North Atlantic right whales were hunted for the past thousand years. Northwest Atlantic right whales remain severely depleted and the Northeast Atlantic right whales were hunted to extinction. The orange Southern right whales and the red North Pacific right whales were also hunted for the past 200 years. So with years from 1920 along the bottom of this graph and numbers of whales up to 30,000 on the left, the red curve shows how southern right whales have recovered well after whaling ended in 1935, <clears throat> while the yellow line shows how North Atlantic right whales have continued to struggle. Looking more closely at the North Atlantic right whales since 1990 in this upper graph to the present, and from just zero to 300 animals on the left, after 2010, their marginal growth reversed into a serious decline where we have about 360 animals left today. Here, intentional whaling has given way to whaling by mistake through vessel collisions and fishing gear entanglement. Our consumer dr demand drives both. Vessels transport oil, goods, and tourists, and hit whales, while traps that meet our demand for lobster and crab entangle them. The difference between the pressure on North and Southern, North Atlantic and Southern right whales is that 90% of the human population lives in the Northern Hemisphere. Thus, the human pressures are far greater here. In this talk, I will focus on the entanglement problem as it is the largest current source of mortality and additionally a major detriment to the health of live whales. Here we have two right whales, the heads of them. The one on the right has its mouth open and you can see the baleen inside the open lips from above. They each have unique patterns of thickened skin, as Veronique said, on their heads called callosities, which also, along with scars that they acquire from trauma, allow them to be repeatedly recognized as individuals, building a catalog of their movements and life events, such as carving, sublethal and vessel and fishing gear trauma, and ultimately, which animal has died from causes that we try to establish by examining their carcasses something that I used to do quite a lot. The catalog maintained at the New England Aquarium informs the status and trends of individuals and the species as a whole. The map here shows North Atlantic right whale sightings for the year of 2020. Today, they are mostly found between Florida and the Gulf of St. Lawrence in Canada. Up until 2010, the Bay of Fundy, as you can see with the arrow there, was the primary Canadian habitat. But with increasing water temperature, their food has moved more to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And now they are commonly found there in summer and fall, which has resulted in major Canadian efforts to reduce a 2017-2019 epidemic of injury and mortality in the Gulf. Vessel strike and entanglement remain a problem in the US and Canada with species survival depending on two critical factors, reducing mortality and better carving, for which living animals have to be spared the sublethal trauma they're currently experiencing. For 25% of the species get entangled every year, reducing their capacity to get pregnant and raise healthy calves. Management strategies need to specifically target elimination of sublethal as well as lethal trauma. Sublethal trauma is the second root of recovery failure and needs to be emphasized far more than it is currently. The graph on the left shows observed and predicted five-year means of right whale deaths up to 2017 in the US and Canada. The rising entanglements in blue, vessel strikes in uh, yellow, and the US legal limit in red. At least I hope my color blindness made that right. The right-hand graph shows annual counts for the past four years, 31 entanglements, 19 vessel strikes. Furthermore, it was recently shown that we only observe about a third of the mortalities. Note that we have wildly exceeded the US legal limit for, for the past 20 years. The rules are there, they have just not been enforced adequately. Here we have the annual new 
right whale calf counts since 2004 in the, the blue line here. The 2009 peak was 39. 2021's much vaunted crop of 14 so far is half of what we should be seeing. So it really isn't a recovery at this point. A result of a combination of poorer nutrition and increasing sublethal entanglement. The yellow bars are the average interval of years between calves for individual moms with the scale on the right axis. Healthy right whales calve every three years. And obviously we haven't achieved that um, in any of these years. Note that 2010 seems to be a turning point. The annual calving has become less on average and the intervals greater. As I said, until the US and Canada focus as much energy on reducing sublethal trauma to enhance calving as they do on mortality, there will be no ultimate recovery of the species. We know that food availability is the primary determinant of right whale body condition and hence calving success. But there is, there is little we can do in the short term to improve that. Whereas we can reduce the amount of entanglement. Entangled right whales can tow rope for months to years throughout their range with major body condition loss over time. These two photographs are of the same whale in 2010, February at the top and December at the bottom. Arrows in the bottom one show the entanglement that it acquired sometime between those two months. Note how it is much thinner after the entanglement. The blue to red lines show the change. My colleague Julie Vanderhoop has shown that the energetic cost of rope drag is comparable to other life history stages. For these two photographs, the southern right whales on the left and the North Atlantic right whale mom and calf on the right show that the body condition of the North Atlantic right whales are relatively much poorer than for the happy chunky whales on the left. Here we have the endless circles that whale conservationists, managers and commercial stakeholders have been dancing around each other for the past 20 years. And I'm trying to just summarize why, why we're in such a mess and, and why, how can we get out of it? Science shows a problem on the left there of vessel strikes and entanglement, as I've shown you. Publishing the data, which are reviewed by expert panels and the media, leading to regulators trying to better enforce the law. This gets inevitable political pushback from impacted commercial stakeholders, with consequent political maneuvering, subsequent lawsuits with lawyers and regulators going back to scientists to justify the current status and trends, and we go off around the corner again. Here is a far better paradigm. The aggrieved stakeholders in the center, in this case, lobster boats being shut out of high risk areas and forced to modify their gear in expensive and often inadequate manners, now work with scientists, conservationists and regulators, managers to test effective solutions. We're working to reduce the amount of entangling rope in the water column by fishing traps, removing the vertical rope up to a surface marker float. A major need is to work with conflicting fisheries where other lobster boats and mobile bottom gear such as draggers need to know where trap gear is located without the benefit of a traditional surface buoy suspending the vertical rope. We are trialing so-called ropeless or buoyless or on-demand traps. Major challenges are cost and safety and efficiency. The logos at the bottom of this slide show the different collaborators we have in an ongoing project funded by the Seawell Conservation Fund, a $900,000 grant for which we're hugely grateful to acquire acoustic gear retrieval systems for the NOAA gear library that lends it to interested boats, such as Rob. The other collaborators we have have also funded and currently work on this project with both inshore and offshore lobster boats. And Mike will talk more about the regulatory side and Rob will talk more about the fishing side. So this animated cartoon shows how whales get entangled in traditional lobster gear. The standard gear consists of a line from a surface buoy down to one or more traps on the bottom. As they swim along with their mouths open, they hit the vertical buoy lines and tend to roll, wrapping around their appendages. If they are small enough, they may drown. 
while the heavier animals swim off with all or part of the gear, towing it until they are able to get it off on their own or with human help, or until they lose weight and die after an average of about six months. A fate that as a veterinarian, I find utterly unacceptable. If such animals were to die on a city street rather than unseen at sea, it would not be tolerated. So what to do? Acoustic retrieval of traps and marking the location vertically on a navigation screen would substantially reduce entanglement risk, perhaps by 90%. This cartoon shows two acoustic methods in trial on the right. Acoustic release of bottom stowed rope or inflation of a bag to lift the end trap. Our trials have shown that the mechanical aspects of the available systems work well. The acoustic releases are very reliable and do not release prematurely. There can be issues with how the rope releases resulting in snarls and we've been iteratively developing the mechanisms and learning from the problems encountered. Adequate operational training is critical, such as how to stow the rope in the first place. Many of these issues have been thoughtfully solved by iterative product development by manufacturers and working with fishermen. So my last slide, in a moment of shameless self-promotion, here is the cover of a book that will be available in November, where I tell the story of were it not for our retail demand for goods moved by sea and trapped caught seafood, the right whale, the North Atlantic right whale could be thriving today. Thus, consumers like you and me are latter-day whalers, albeit unintentionally. What you all can do is this, tell your state and federal representatives that you care about the problem. Ask your retail sources of trap caught seafood for lobsters caught without an end line. Seek out such sources, knock on Rob's door. Respond to requests for comments on right whale conservation measures in state and federal agency rulemaking, which is going on right now. Subscribe to media accounts that tell you about such opportunities, such as whales.org and i4.org, ifaw.org. And support agencies that disentangle right whales, such as coastalstudies.org. And buy my book. Royalties will go into right whale conservation here at Hui. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Now let's hear from our next presenter, Rob Martin. Rob has worked as a full-time commercial fisherman on Cape Cod and the Massachusetts South Shore for more than 40 years. He started lobstering off a skiff, a small boat, when he was in high school. Currently, Rob is involved both with numerous commercial fishing associations and with efforts to find thoughtful, practical strategies to enable commercial fishing to coexist with North Atlantic right whales. Through collaborations with Hui and other scientists, rope and acoustic technology manufacturers, and other stakeholders. Welcome, and thank you for joining us, Rob. Thank you very much, and I'm glad to be here. Like Veronica said, I'm, I've been a commercial fisherman now for over 40 years, and I'm currently in my seventh year of a closure for the North Atlantic right whale, which encompasses over 3,000 square nautical miles. And when that first hit back in 2015, it was kind of hard to, to fathom. So a bunch of us got together. We started up an old organization that was dormant for a while, it was the oldest fishing organization around. And we started looking at all the problems to see what we could do to get back fishing. And we've come up with uh, modified vertical lines using best available science. And currently for the last few years, I've been fishing some acoustic gear and testing it and actual fishing it along with other individuals inshore and offshore. Like I said, we're trying to get back into a closed area. And right now, if you're closed, you're not going fishing. That closure spans for February through um, April 30th, three months or just over. And currently in Massachusetts, the closure just got lengthened to all the state waters in area one to the New Hampshire border. And there's other areas that are being talked about now. So like I said, we are trying to get back into a closed area fishing acoustic gear to coexist with the North Atlantic right whale. So a few years back, when we decided looking at some of the acoustic stuff, acoustics has been around for a long time, at least 40 years. And we talked to one company, which my nephew was an intern 
And we looked at the gear, talked to him for a while, and we wanted to make some modifications to actual how we could use it. So a friend of mine, Mike Lane, decided to design a pot farm for an end trap. Then I met another individual, another company, and I, which is a lift bag system. And we've been working with him ever since. Like I said, I've been fishing five different systems in the whole scheme of the whole fishery. It's not ready for prime time. It's expensive. It is stuff to be worked out. But within a few years, in monthly, the progress being made, it's like we've been to the moon and back already. It's ready, not ready for prime time, but for small sections areas in a closed area where they're not ready for prime time players. I'm sure some people know what that means if you're old enough. And Canada this past year, up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, which a few years back had a serious problem with a lot of right wheel deaths when they were up there with entanglements and ship strikes in the Canadian snow crab fishery. This past year, a handful of snow crabbers went back fishing in a closed area using acoustics with the edge tech system. And right now the system that I'm using, the edge tech, can, it goes into three different systems. It's the edge tech 5112, trap and trap with rope and a boy that comes to the surface there's the hui spool with an edge tech modem and the lift bag system by smelts with the edge tech modem which is in compressed air and it comes to the system and these specific systems have specific codes to them to release them and they cannot prematurely release by themselves and it's an on-call system and with the trap tracker app from edge tech you can actually see where the gear is with another fisherman fishing next to you or another individual who has the app could be some mobile gear steaming through would see where the gear is on the bottom how it's set it's good for law enforcement they could sit in their office and see where all the gear is on a on a program it's just for them one of the individuals at edge tech can sit in his office and watched where all the gear was up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence this year, where it was all set. When it's set, Latin wants, and everything else. It's a surface marking system, which is if you had a boy in the water, it's not showing exactly where it is in the bottom, but it would be, a, it's a surface marking. And if I was steaming through an area, I could see where the gear is and know what was there. And like I said, we've been fishing it with special permits, hybridly with a boy on one end and the acoustic gear on the other end, along with other systems we've been working on, like I said, inshore and offshore. We're also working with telemetry boys to put on these systems on the surface and also a subsea telemetry boy, which is on the acoustic trap, which when it gets released, it sends a signal to a satellite and shows that that acoustic trap is on the surface which there are systems we have now on some of them they can see that but this system was was more as you can see on the on the screen right there you can see the air lift bag and there was a little telemetry boy which is the telemetry boys going to a satellite and documenting where that gear should be i could sit home look at it on the computer and watch it and i've had pretty good success with it along with some other individuals there's always something's going to go wrong no matter if i'm fishing regularly with a vertical line or with no vertical line nothing's the same every day with weather conditions or we lose ends to bow traffic stuff snapping off i've had to grapple for gear before if i would lose both ends i have gear conflict now with mobile gear in certain areas where i fish but like I said, we were just looking to get back in, are looking to get back in, in a small specific areas with low density of whales, with the best available technology and the acoustics that we have going now. And it just keeps on growing and growing from there. Like I said, if you want to stay fishing, I was a 12 month commercial fisherman, which I lost that. And now I am, if I was younger, I'd be paying attention and wanting to get involved just to see what you can do and um, just Absolutely. the work I've done with the scientists, fishermen and engineers, we all have to work together. If we don't, nothing's gonna get done. I wanna solve the problem. 
and I want to keep fishing along with everybody else. And I don't want to see nothing happen to a whale or right whale in particular. And I've had the thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, Rob. Thank you so much. Um, we'll get to talk more about these issues during the Q&A. We're already getting a ton of questions, so that's great. Um, before we go on to our next speaker, uh, we do have a poll for you tonight. Um, so, uh, sorry. Um, so this poll is uh, sort of themed to go with Valentine's Day, if you will. Uh, we wanna test your knowledge of love and family but of North Atlantic right whales, of course. Um, so you're going to see some options coming up on your screen. You'll see three options, and you have to pick the one that is true. So which of the, there's two, you're going to see two that are false and one that is true. So please pick the correct one. And we'll give folks a minute here to vote. All right, here are our results. And uh, about 60% of you got the right answer. Both males and females mate with multiple partners. And that's to increase the chances of a pregnancy occurring. Um, Michael, if you'll come back on camera for just a second. Um, so I know a lot of animals, the males will actually physically compete uh, for females, but Right whales do something a little different. Uh, do you want to talk about that for a minute? Sure. I'm going to find my little cheat sheet here. <laughs> yeah. You, yeah, you know than, the answer. <laughs> yeah, the answer that I can tell. Rather than males physically competing for females, the sperm compete to reach the female's eggs in a process called sperm competition. Right. And, and, another, and I th yeah, go I ahead. Did. Another factoid here is that most calves are fathered by a few of the older males. My colleague, Tim Frazier, a number of years ago, looked at the genetics of, of these animals and that's the, that was his conclusion. Interesting. And this is something you, you touched on in your presentation, but one of the big challenges for right whales today is that the females need to be in good physical condition in order to become pregnant. And since so many whales are underweight, either due to poor nutrition or from dragging fishing gear, if they're entangled, pregnancies and birth rates are much lower than they should be, as you showed us in that, in that yellow bark chart. Right. All right, we'll come back to that during the q and I'm sure, but now I'd like to introduce our third and final speaker, Mike Asaro. Mike is an ecological economist and marine policy researcher at the NOAA Fisheries Northeast Fisheries Science Center. He currently leads a research program investigating policy pathways to reduce human impacts on endangered and protected marine species, including the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale. Mike is a native of Gloucester, Massachusetts and grew up in a commercial fishing family. Mike, welcome. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. And hi, thank you for joining us. And thank you to the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution uh, for the opportunity to be here along with Michael and Rob. I'm a policy researcher at the Northeast Fishery Science Center in Woods Hole, where I study how science is used to make decisions to protect marine mammals and sea turtles. Uh, my perspective in exploring issues related to the North Atlantic right whale is not necessarily on the whales themselves, but on the people involved in protecting them. I study the policy processes in hopes of finding ways to improve it and therefore improve outcomes for the whales themselves. Uh, with that in mind, one of the questions that I get most frequently from others who are observing the challenges that right whales face is why haven't we solved this problem already? And it's a good question and a logical question even, but the trouble with this question is it's too simple to capture the complexities of the problem. Human interactions with right whales is a complex system. And the trouble with complex systems is that they can present problems that are much more challenging to solve than they might initially appear. And this is a complex system that involves all of us. 
from commercial fishing to support the domestic and international seafood supply to support thousands of coastal communities like the one I grew up in and to support the lives and livelihoods of people like Rob and those who depend on him and others to make a living from the ocean to commercial shipping where goods are transported across the globe, including perhaps some of the food that you might have for dinner tonight or even a phone or computer you're using to view this presentation. My point is that humans and right whales are deeply connected in a dynamic system. And while the downside of this is that the problems that can arise can be substantial and they can involve all of us. The upside is that we can also all be the part of the solution if we so choose. From a federal perspective, both the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act play central roles in how we protect right whales now and into the future. The Endangered Species Act has been a tool to reduce vessel collisions with right whales since 2008, mainly through zones like the one you can see here that mandate vessels to speeds of 10 knots or less to reduce lethal entanglements through, um, uh, to prevent ship strikes, excuse me, and the Marine Mammal Protection Act has been central to reduce lethal entanglements through federal regulations known as the Atlantic Large Whale Take Reduction Plan. Both of these laws include processes that solicit input from stakeholders and members of the public like you on the direction that we ought to move forward. In fact, both laws have open comment periods on right whales right now asking for precisely that input from all of you. Over time, it's my hope that we can gain the best possible understanding of the relationship between our economic activity and the ecosystems from which they come and to which they impact. It may help give us better tools to protect right whales. Like here on the left, a map of federal lobster management zones, for example. The more we engage with and respect existing fishery management institutions and policy frameworks, the more likely we are to put forward measures that will succeed. And in understanding ecosystem relationships too. For example, here on the right in red are the areas in which fishing lines and right whales have co-occurred in the recent past. But the ecosystem is a dy dynamic and changing system too. And the areas in which co-occurrence was high in the past may or may not be a good indicator of how things will be in the future. We need measures that are resilient in time and space to ever-changing economic and ecological conditions. So, while I continue to study this complex system in the hopes that we can make better decisions in the future, I encourage all of you to seize your opportunity today, learn about the policy process, and participate in it as often as you can so that your voice will be heard. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And thank you again to Rob Martin and Michael Moore. All right, now it is time for questions from our audience. Um, please remember that you can submit your question uh, using the Q&A function in Zoom. Um, I'm gonna start us out with a question and I'm gonna uh, give it to Michael to start with. So why um, isn't everyone in commercial lobstering already using ropeless gear? There's obviously advantage obvious advantages for the for the whales why um why aren't why isn't everyone using them well we've we've touched on that peripherally over the last 15 minutes or so you need an experimental permit to use buoyless gear in that a surface marker is a legal requirement so until that changes uh, it's only ever going to be an experimental situation the surface buoy identifies gear on the bottom and signals to other bottom users, such as other trap fishers and mobile gear users, such as draggers and scallopers, where the gear is, thus minimizing gear conflict. We do have the apps, as, as Rob showed, that allows the deployment location to be shared with other users in the area. And the beginnings of acoustic ranging and where the gear is physically located on the bottom. So the gear conflict thing is going to be the biggest challenge that we still have to meet. Mechanically, as you saw with Rob, you know, he's catching ropes, ropeless lobster very successfully. But we need further trials 
and also adaptation to the needs of individual fishermen because everybody fishes differently and you know that that's another whole piece but that will rapidly evolve once the uh, opportunity to fish ropelessly especially in closed areas opens up because the incentive is very substantial so you know yeah. it's yeah, go ahead i was just going to ask if rob had anything he wanted to to add to that well let, let michael finish so <laughs> All right. So basically, I was just going to say that currently ropeless gear retrieval is slower than the traditional method, but that will improve with time. And there are significant safety concerns with the absence of a surface buoy to retrieve a crew member entangled in gear going over the side. And obviously that's, that's um, I mean, one, one solution to that would be that the entangled crew member wears a buoy in the form of a BFD. So, you know. But that's that's obviously a, a cultural change, and, and so much of this is all about cultural change as well. And as Rob can say a lot better than I can. Yeah. So Rob, I you know I know there is quite a bit of resistance to this whole idea of of ropeless gear. You're you're an exception rather than the rule. I think among among uh, people working in the fishing industry, what well, what do you see as the as the key to getting more people interested in or able to adopt this kind of gear? Like I said, I'm only, in, not myself, but a bunch of us, we're in, we're in year seven right now of a closure. That's 21 months. Then you add a month on top of that on each end. To, I don't fish like I used to fish. So I'm trying to find ways to get back fishing along with other individuals. Like I said, I was full time. I, that's all I did. My hundred percent of my income was that. As I get older now, it's, it's still, I put my daughter through college, mortgage payments, everything else. But if I was younger individual in this industry, I'd be really paying attention on what's going on. And like I said, we're trying to get back into parts of a closed area. If you're not closed, it's like, oh, what are you doing? You're crazy. But when that hits, it, it hits hard. And like I said, you get a fisherman, you shut him out. We're going to try to figure a way to get back in. And plus, if you get a fisherman working with a scientist and an engineer, then working with policymakers, we're going to get something done. And like I said, I want to solve the problem, help solve the problem. I've been in this industry too long, and I've seen a lot of stuff, everything evolve. As Michael stated earlier, you saw the slide. It's like a big circle. It's a dog chasing its tail. All I hear is the same stuff. Nothing gets done. And I'm going to quote a good friend of mine who I learned a lot from was John Haviland, a very wise man. And a lot of people, you don't want to hear the problem. You put your head in the sand, I'll throw your hat down and stomp your hat. What do you do? You get a dirty hat. And like I said, we're trying to solve the problem. And I see a lot of people who like to keep the water muddy. So then you don't know, you can't see the bottom. Another stupid saying, but I'm just, I want to solve it and move on from there. I hear a lot of talk about stuff and nothing ever happens or very little things. A band aid gets put on something. I want to get done, go back fishing and, and just keep on moving on. So, and do the best, best that I can and everybody else can. So there there have been some references to uh, to closures and a closed area. And uh, apparently some folks in the audience might uh, be confused by that. So what you're talking about is areas that are closed for a certain period of the year to fishing yeah. because right whales are in the area. Correct. We would shut. It was over 3000 square nautical miles. It got proposed in 2014. It first came into effect in 2015 in Closures seem to get bigger over time. They don't go away. So what I always try to tell people, pay attention and try to solve the problem. And I want to solve the problem. I don't want to just keep on 10, 20 years from now, be still talking about the same thing. Because when I go back and read papers and stuff that was we're trying, it's the same stuff 20 years ago, 10 years ago. 30 years ago, I seen, and I don't see anything changing. It's not that you need ropes for the whole fishery. You don't. But like I said, once you get closed, that you're closed. 
And some individuals it doesn't bother if they're part-time fishermen. They don't care. But for the full-time fishermen, that's a big hit. A really hard financial hit. Yeah, we had a question from, from Ron. Is there a list of seafood companies that use acoustic traps? But but nobody's using these commercially yet, right? That's not. You actually, this coming up season, if you're buying Canadian snow crab, they just bought, I think, 70 oh. more units to fish up there in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in a closed area, which that was a single trap fishery, the big traps. But they've trawled up and those trawls extend I mean, I don't know how far, far far apart they're doing it, each trap, but they're very long trawls. And these are big boats too, so. But to get those guys, and it's very lucrative fishery, and to get those guys fishing back in a closed area, I think it was, I think 10 individuals this past year. Now they get that 70 more units coming to fish this upcoming year. So, and no matter what people see, stuff a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes to try to solve the problem so and michael a number of people are are asking about the groups that you mentioned at the end of your talk you know people to get in touch with and i just want to remind the audience that this will be recorded so you can uh you'll be able to see the recording and and go back to that point and hear those groups again if you want to look them up and maybe we can also add them to to the website uh in writing to make that a little easier but um, there's an interesting question uh, for you, Michael. You said that in addition to entanglements, there's a problem with nutrition, um, which this person took to mean that the whales aren't getting enough food or maybe the food isn't as of good quality. Can you talk a little more about that uh, and what's going on there? Sure. Right whales are incredibly skilled feeders. Uh, they are able to find the densest, the most lipid rich, the most energy rich uh, patch of food in their neighborhood. And to, 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 to do that, they have to um, move around a lot. And that requires both the biology and the physics to all come together. So that not only are there plenty of, of these copepods in the water column, but they're in the right patch density at a small scale. And you can see how they maneuver around to do that. So depending upon the physical and the biological conditions, the, the success of their foraging can vary a lot. And uh, really the North Atlantic seems to be less right whale favorable than say the Southern Ocean in terms of the way that the Southern right whales are doing well. So at that scale, we've got a species wide issue, but also regionally, the food has moved around. It used to be very, very dense and rich and favorable for them, say, in the Bay of Fundy. It still is in, the, in Cape Cod Bay. But um, much of the food that used to be in the Bay of Fundy seems to be showing up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence now, and we haven't really got a good handle on, on what's going on. But certainly uh, the, the way that these animals are maturing and the body condition doesn't seem to be so good as it was 20, 30 years ago. All right. Um, this might be a question for Mike um, from Carolyn. Are there grants or incentives for fishermen to try out uh, some of this new gear? There are. There are. And it's a good question. As uh, Michael mentioned, there was the one from uh, SeaWorld, uh, which has, was able to purchase a significant amount of gear that can be loaned out to fishermen as needed for those who uh, would like to use it. Um, but it's a good question, and I think that that's that's a good approach. Um, so much of the the concern about ropeless gear is the cost itself, and to an individual fisherman, and especially as Rob said, a fisherman who may not be subject to a closure, the fisherman has to wonder what the benefit is um, with costs that are high. Now we know that costs will come down; they always do with new technologies. And that's really how I like to view the case of ropeless as just a new and emerging technology that whose cost is high initially and will go down over time. And I think to put it in to put the ropeless issue in maybe context that is um, helpful for the viewers, I like to think of it in terms of electric cars. 
some of the viewers now may already be driving electric cars. Uh, some may not. Some may think they're too expensive. Some may think they're not practical. To someone who already owns one, it is practical, sure. But the decision on whether somebody will change their gas car to an electric car is done on an individual basis, and it's different for all of us. Now, if you're in Rob's case and someone tells you or the government tells you you can't drive for three months of the year unless you drive an electric car, your decision to adopt one may come sooner than somebody who isn't faced with such an issue. So it's, I think of it in terms of the adoption rate, how the cost may be high now, but we would expect them to go down. What might that look like and how can we influence how fishermen might adopt them? And things like grants to buy gear seems like a great place to start. All right. Um, so several people have asked about fish farming. Um, would that help to reduce the number of lines in the water? I, I don't know if that's an option for creatures like lobsters. Rob is shaking his head. Do you want to answer that one? You're on mute, Rob. There you are. There I am. Well, I don't know nothing about fish farming, but if you're worried about getting entangled in a vertical line, a fish farm has, last I knew, there's a nets big. I think actually, actually humpbacks have gotten stuck in some of those nets in like a, I thought sand, in a salmon fish farm at one point. I'm, I'm not sure. That's, I don't know nothing about it, but that'd be, if you got something in the water column, if, I, it's, if I'm getting shut out, with a vertical line, I can't see how you're having a massive pens floating in the ocean that someone's going to get stuck into the mesh or, or in a fish farm. That's that's just me. Yeah, Michael, I don't, know. I don't know nothing about them. Yeah, Michael, do you see any potential there for a shift to to farming rather than? Well, I, I'm with Rob. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, what so... I'm doing now is actually farming the farming the lobster. I'm feeding them a place to stay, they go in and eat, and they leave again. And I think they're trained by now as they're growing up with the amount of gear in the water. The trap is like a restaurant for them. So, like I said, we're, we're, just, we're at a critical point right now to continue the research, what we're doing, and especially in a closed area. And we just need the support from the feds and from the state. And like I said, we want to solve the problem and get back fishing. And like I said, if I was a younger guy right now, I'd be paying attention just just because. So, and I'm on the ladder and going down because I'm getting older. So, but hopefully, we've wide. got a couple other. Sorry, go ahead. There's a delay. Um, Michael, we've got a couple questions for you that are sort of related. So, one is, uh, do you give injured whales veterinary help? Uh, someone who keyed in on the fact that you're a veterinarian. And sort of maybe more broadly, how successful, uh, that was from Olivia and from Jeff, we have how successful have we been with disentangling whales from, from fishing gear? So this kind of related questions, maybe you could address both. Well, let's, let me take the second one first, because the, the, the first one follows on logically from that. The Center for Coastal Studies have been the sort of ground zero for the last 20, 30 years in Provincetown for removing gear, especially from right whales, but humpback whales and other species too. And they're very, very good at it. And when they get access to the animal, uh, especially with humpbacks, they, they, they disentangle them a lot. Right whales are harder, they're bigger, stronger and uglier. And that requires more effort and is not so often successful, but has been spectacularly at times. And so, uh, but they will never encounter anything but the minority of entangled animals. So many will die or have serious injuries from them um, in spite of their very best efforts. And, you know, disentanglement has become a global uh, tool. It's no solution, but it does uh, reduce the problem significantly. And it began in Newfoundland in the 70s. And you know, the folks from Center for Coastal Studies now are training globally with the International Whaling Commission's help to... Um, in many of the most of the different continents as, as this, this is going on. So having said that, uh, to answer the first question, uh, as a veterinarian, my, my role over the years has been diagnosis, treatment, prevention. And so you know, diagnosis in the necropsies, 
the treatment piece was where we started to use sedatives to facilitate the disentanglement of refractory, very difficult cases to work with. It's, it's been a difficult process in itself, but we're still working on it. And this animal, in fact, that you can see there was disentangled only because of the, the facilitation of that by using drugs. It died about a week later from the entanglement issues that it had, but uh, that and some other animals have all been uh, treated at sea, if you like, which I, I think was um, unique in terms of large whales, at least. And so how to inject drugs into whales was one of the challenges that who we helped me work out uh, over the years and uh, so on. So yes, there are, there are roles for veterinarians to play at sea. I've lost the uh, question, so I'm sorry for not saying the person's name, but someone wanted to know how long right whales live if, you know, if things were optimal for them. Um, we don't really know, but I would think uh, 100 years or so seems reasonable. The, wow. the bowhead whale, which is its Arctic cousin, and is known to be almost twice that. And so we're killing them off as youngsters, uh, and it's, it's really sad to see that happen. This is a question for you, Mike, um, from Aaron. Uh, you mentioned that now is a great time to learn the policy process in terms of North Atlantic right whale uh, measures. The policy process uh, has a lot of legal jargon that is incredibly daunting and convoluted for many people who might be interested in getting involved. Do you have any recommendations on where people can learn more about the process if they're not, you know, if they don't have a degree in conservation management or policy? That's a great question. We're so glad, so glad you asked, Erin. Um, I would say, so speaking from a federal perspective, so, so NOAA um, administers both of these laws that protect whales from ship strikes and entanglements. And the processes that um, the policies go through are open and public. So I would say a good place to start is to sign up for email alerts on the issues that you care about on the NOAA Fisheries, Greater Atlantic Regional Fisheries Office in Northeast Fisheries Science Center website. So you can be aware of when the meetings are and you can attend or you can write or you can make your voice heard however you'd like. Um, I'd also like to point out that while we, while we think of the, of the federal government as, as a big um, entity, you know, it's made up of people like me. So you can always pick up the phone and call or email anybody who's working at NOAA to give your input on any issue. And the last thing I'd say is the policy process is influenced by public opinion uh, pretty significantly. So even if you're not engaging with the government directly, um, talk about right whales, share stories with people, post things on social media, write a letter to the editor, Keep the topic in the news, keep the topic in people's minds. As Michael said earlier, we wouldn't tolerate this for a terrestrial animal, meaning that right whales suffer in part because they're living in the ocean out of our view. If we were to see them more on a daily basis and they were a more significant and visible part of our lives, we may be more inclined to take action from... Um, so I think the more we can do to share these stories and talk about them with friends, family, and neighbors and keep the topic um, at the forefront of our minds and help influence public opinion, I think that actually does quite a bit for the policy process as well. So, so one more thing to say here. Um, in terms of ag advocacy, I, I mentioned those couple of organizations, whales.org and ifo.org, but clf.org, the Conservation Law Foundation, has also got a lot of good information and roots of, for advocacy there as well. Thank you. Um, we've had some questions uh, about other sources of mortality to, to whales. So Lewis asks about ocean noise pollution, um, and I think someone else did as well. Um, and then uh, James asked whether there are diseases that can uh, either affect the whales or reduce calving rates. Um, do you wanna to speak to those other s potential sources sure. of mortality and how they relate maybe to what we're talking about already? Yeah, the, the noise issue for right whales is really interesting and hard to get a good handle on, but it's certainly very significant. Uh, whether it be episodic noise, such as seismic survey with air guns or background ship noise, uh, it's been shown that the animals can 
um, change the frequency of the vocalization to try and get out of the cocktail party type syndrome. Um, and certainly the, the range at which they can hear decreases. So the social communication and the, hey, the, there's food over here, they don't do so well. So how to quantify that in terms of impact on the animals is very difficult, but it's absolutely a problem. And you had the other question was... About disease, how, disease whether yes. disease is well, a factor. Basically, diagnostically, for, for when we look at the dead animals, uh, where we see situations that are likely not human caused are with the neonates, with the calves, where the, the usual um, you know, uh, difficult calvings or failing to thrive or, or, or various abnormalities, which you'd expect to get in a portion of any, any calf of, of a wild animal. But uh, beyond that, we're really ignorant about uh, infectious disease in, in right whales and whales in general, but there are some parasites for sure, and uh, intestinal and, and other things too, which uh, we need to understand further. But whether or not those diseases contribute to the mortalities that we've been observing, it's certainly the case that the trauma is a major factor in both vessel strikes and, and entanglements. The vessel strikes, they either get chopped up by propellers or they get bruised badly and broken bones from being hit by blunt parts of the ship. So it's, it's a major problem along with the fishing gear entanglement. And we could do a whole session on, on ship strikes and how to, how to deal with that some other time. There's an interesting question from Jim that I, I want to get in uh, about genetic diversity. Does the current population, with it being so small, have enough genetic diversity to, to sustain the species? That's another good question and hard to answer. There are certainly, there's less diversity than there used to be in terms of uh, museum specimens that have been looked at genetically. Uh, I'm not a geneticist. I, want, I don't want to sort of put forward too much here, but I, I think the answer is we don't really know if that's a substantial piece of our current failure. But all I can tell you is that if the animal's dead, its genes aren't going to do it much good. This isn't a question. I, I do have another question coming, but, uh, but I just wanted to get this in. Uh, we have Mark who says to you, Rob, uh, don't give up and thank you for all your personal efforts. So that's a nice comment there from Mark. Well, um, <laughs> excellent. Um, in, in your personal experience, Rob, actually, I'm curious, what have been the most challenging things about using this, this gear to you? Um, and, and what have been the successes of it, I guess, um, would be the flip side of that challenging thing to me was let's see if it'll work which it did we actually been customizing talking with the manufacturers to customize it to make it work for us on how we're fishing whether it's on my boat another boat or fishing it offshore on one of the boats and that's to me that's and i'm we were always tweaking stuff as we went along by where, where, how to put the modem, just use a separate end trap, uh, where to put a pickup buoy onto the bag or, or, in, or when the rope came to the surface, because you're not going to just be grabbing a rope or a trap that's below the surface and I'm going to grab that with 150 pounds and grab it, put it on my boat. I st still had the pickup buoy we put in the trap or fold it up in the bag. So I would just gaff that, put that right in my hollow one step. Acoustic track came in the boat. I pushed it back to my crew and deflated the bag or repacked the rope and we put it on deck and it was fishing as normal. What we were doing, it's like I said, we were tweaking things as we went along to make it how we want to make it work for us and how we can make it work for ourselves. And like I said, right, well, you can see that was just a phone that had an iPad on the boat to do the other stuff or on my computer, but and Offshore, they had um, the sat phones doing all the work. And I also got a cell booster on my boat in areas where I'd have poor cell coverage to get the, mm -hmm. one of the apps to do it. But that's all downloaded, and I have no problem with that. And eventually, that's going to be downloaded. You'll be getting that in your chat plot or on, on one of your computer programs on the boat, and everything's going to be right there. 
I wanted to mention, we just saw it again, but those uh, great animations that we've been seeing uh, throughout the night are uh, were made by one of my colleagues, Natalie Rainier. So I just wanted to give her a little shout out. Oh, They're really cool. great. Yeah. And, and yeah. if you want to see more of Natalie's drawings, you need to buy my book. There you go. Um, all right. Um, so I think we're getting close to time here. Um, but I uh, wanted to give this question. Um, so let's see. What is the single, this is from Kristen. Uh, what is the single most important thing that we as a family can do to help the North Atlantic right whale? Go for well, it, Michael. I'll take, I'll take it. Um, be active in expressing your opinions to the people that you can communicate with to express your desire to see this problem solved. And that be with your neighbors, your friends, the people you buy stuff from that comes by ship or by the, the lobsters you're buying, the federal or state legal process, they do listen to, to a weight of evidence, but ultimately this is a political problem. The politics, and rightly so, of folks like Susan Collins, that she sees the huge economic uh, value of lobstering in Maine, especially. That's true in Massachusetts too, and I utterly respect that. But what we're trying to do here is to conserve both the industry and the species. And it's doable, it's gonna be expensive. Mike's gonna have to pull some serious subsidies together for making this work. But it is all doable, but the balance of, of opinion and pressure needs to change and people like Rob need to be supported and the gear has to be you know acquired and and become you know legally appropriate and, but every individual who has an opinion about this can make a huge difference. Rob what would you say to your uh, fellow fishermen out there? Um, never take anything for granted and pay attention and knowledge is power, the more you know, and get involved. Because it. I get guys calling me all the time. And some say, what are you crazy for doing that? And I'm like, if I gave you 10 of these, you could go back fishing in, the clo in a closed area, would you go? Oh, yeah. And just, I don't like change personally. I kick and scream and do whatever. But like I said, being closed will myself and a lot of the guys up and it closures don't seem to go away they just get bigger and like i said if i'm not pushing it for the whole industry i said i'm just keep on stating it we're looking to get back and to start out small it's not a wham bam oh next week or next month or next year it's this is industry-wide no way but if i was younger a younger fisherman, I'd be paying attention and I would want to be at the table if I had the opportunity to do something instead of being out on the sidelines, getting something pushed down my throat that I couldn't use or do. Then I'd rather be at the table to try to solve the problem and make it work for me so I could get Makes back. Makes a lot of sense. Yep. In hindsight, Mike. 2020, so... Mike, did you have anything else you, you wanted to add? No, I mean, I would just echo what's been said. Uh, engage, engage in the process. Write letters to people who you think can make a difference. Make a difference yourself if that's how you'd like to approach it. Spread the word to other people. You know, learn about the whales, read about the whales. There were a thousand people on here tonight. If each one of those people went and spoke to others, then we could spread the word pretty quickly. People care about whales. We all do. And that's something that we can we can share with others and learn about and and make a difference if um, if enough people are willing. All right, I think we're going to leave it there. Um, and I want to say a very big thank you to all of you, uh, Rob Martin, Mike Asaro, and Michael Moore, for participating in tonight's event and sharing your views and insights on this complicated topic. Thank you also to all of my Hui colleagues who've been working very hard behind the scenes to make this event possible. And to all of you out there who joined us, thank you. Uh, tonight's event was the second in our third season of Hui's Ocean Encounters virtual series. 
our next ocean encounter will be on Wednesday, March 24th at 7.30 p.m. So please mark your calendars. That's Wednesday, March 24th. Um, as you can see on the screen there, we'll have a conversation on the theme of radioactivity in the ocean with Hui Marine radiochemist Ken Bissler. We hope you'll join us for that. To register or to find out more information about our Ocean Encounter series, please visit us at hui.edu forward slash ocean encounters. Sorry, that's ocean hyphen encounters. Let me say that whole web address again, hui.edu forward slash ocean hyphen encounters. You might also want to take a look at the very cool merchandise at our online store. Uh, that's shop.hui.edu. You get a 15% event discount for joining us tonight. So just type in the discount code OCEAN for that. If you enjoyed tonight's Ocean Encounters program, you can be part of HUI's solution-based approach to ocean science. Please be consider becoming a HUI member. I'm one. Uh, you'll be providing crucial support for our outreach and our science, and you'll get some great benefits in return. Membership starts at just $35 a year. The average gift is $100, but any amount helps. Your support will make a difference. On behalf of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, thank you all very much and good night. Out where the seas are the deepest and the mysteries the greatest lies our future. The ocean is our last unexplored, ungoverned frontier, the life support system for our planet inextricably linked to our climate and weather and to the lives and livelihoods of countless people around the globe. But even against the ocean's vastness, humankind can be a formidable force. What happens next demands action that is rooted in scientific understanding and unvarnished truth. Because our world stands at a fork in the road. In one direction, we watch the ocean being catastrophically altered beyond its ability to sustain us. In the other, understanding outraces exploitation and we help steward and protect this most precious shared resource. What will be the legacy of the 21st century? Here and now, the world's most impressive collection of minds passionately dedicated to ocean science, engineering, education, and policy has a role to play, with the expertise to know what works and a trusted voice to present the facts as we uncover them, we can shape the future. We can inform governments, businesses, and conservationists. We can be the catalyst for change and unleash new knowledge in service of society. It is more than our responsibility. It is the defining moment of our generation. We our Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And this is our time. <laughs>